Okay, welcome to Denver Dale Amateur Radio Club. I'm delighted to see um, members of the club uh, from Yorkshire and, of course, now from other parts of the world. And uh, Nick, our speaker tonight, M0NTV, will have spotted on our participants list. We've got uh, people on the call tonight from South Africa, from Germany, from Belgium, uh, from the United States, um, who have actually become members of Denbydale Radio Club. Um, and uh, they've so much enjoyed what we've been doing over the last year. Uh, they wanted to support us by becoming members and we've been delighted to welcome them in. Uh, so Nick, uh, just a couple of words uh, of introduction to you and then I'll hand over to you. Uh, I hadn't come across Nick M0NTV before, before he came along to speak at the GQRP club convention in September and gave a, uh, for me, one of the best um, contributions of the entire weekend. I don't make your head too big, Nick, because there were some incredible people speaking at that event. Uh, but, um, uh, talking about uh, his uh, homebrew uh, radio transceiver he'd built and put into a bread bin, if I remember rightly, Nick. Um, and uh, it was fantastic. And I, I spotted, and in fact, I said to Nick, because I think I might have chaired the session you spoke at, I said to Nick, I'm going to book you for coming to speak at Denby Dale because um, I, I know you've got a, a talk that will interest people. So, Nick, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, uh, you can take it away. Well, thank you very much. Well, uh, good evening, everybody, from wherever you happen to be uh, joining us in the world. It's it's lovely to see you. And uh, and yes, thank you very much um, to Nick, the other Nick, for, for your kind invitation to, to speak um, at uh, the Denbydale ARS. Right. Um, now, let me just um, share my screen and get me, uh, me thing going here. Just remember to uh, share the sound and optimise the video clip. And hopefully this should... Right. Okay, fantastic. Are you all seeing that screen? Yes, yeah, brilliant. Marvellous, thank you. Um, yeah, well, yes, well, my name's Nick. Um, uh, QTH here is uh, Bournemouth on the, uh, uh, the south coast. And um, I've not really, I've, I'm a kind of Johnny come lately, really, to amateur radio. I've always been interested in tinkering with electronics and, um, and, and radio, uh, I, I guess, in general. Um, but I've only really been licensed for, for three years and, uh, uh, and kind of accelerated th through a lot of it. Um, and quickly discovered, um, as you know, as it's often said, amateur radio is a hobby of a, a thousand hobbies, isn't it? There's so many different rabbit <laughs> warrens you can uh, you can jump down, so many different things you can get interested in. Um, the the yeah, home brewing, I mean, b building uh, my own radios and, and radio kit uh, w is is just something that really interests me. Um, so I should say from the outset, I am by no means an expert. <laughs> I am the amateur in amateur radio, right? So let's just put that right out there from the from the outset. I have no formal training in electronics or engineering, any of that stuff at all. I am just someone who's fascinated with it, really, and and, and that's it, you know. And and um, and if, if people are kind enough to to let me share my uh, uh, passion about building radios, then 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 I try and take them up on it. So um, now, what what I want to talk about actually <clears throat> is about the way I build, and actually, it, it's it's kind of important because it, it, it can make a difficult project doable, depending on how you approach uh, anything you're going to build. So um, the the way I approach is is a modular thing, and that's why this thing's called uh, uh, building with blocks. It's about taking what could be a very complex project and breaking it down into little bite-sized doable things that you could do in an evening or over a weekend and testing them and, and stringing them together and, and doing it that way. And we're actually going to take a concrete example of something that um, I, I built for, for this uh, talk. And uh, you're going to see little bits of video and, and, and lots of pictures and all kinds of other stuff. Um, and I should say right at the beginning, I've got a copy of these slides in PDF form, which um, I can make available to Nick. And if anybody wants them, you're welcome to have them. Likewise, um, uh, there's, there's other things I can, I can let you have as well um, uh, as, as we go along. But uh, let's crack on with it. So, uh, oh, right, okay. Oops, I need to, right. So when I say building, 
Um, what do I mean? Well, when I talk about building, I'm talking about home brewing, scratch building, i.e. not building a kit. Now, there's nothing wrong with kits, right? I love kits. I've built many, many kits, and I still enjoy building kits. Um, and actually, what I would say, and I don't know who I'm talking to here. I mean, you, you might all be expert builders, and, and you know, I'm trying to teach me gran granny to suck eggs here. Or there may be people here that have not done very much, and that's really where I'm going. I'm just trying to encourage people to kind of give this a go. So apologies, you know, um, if, if I am um, pretty sure they're converted. Um, but if, if you haven't done much kind of hands-on construction, then, then building kits is a brilliant way to start. Um, and I would even say, you know, forget, forget what I'm going to say tonight, go out, buy some kits and build them if you've not done it, because it's just handling the components, recognizing resistor color codes, learning how to solder properly. You know, all these things are, are skills that are going to set you up for anything else that you do. Um, and it will just give you some confidence because when you build a kit, you get all the parts, the boards all laid out. If it doesn't work, there's somebody you can phone up and ask him, you know, um, there's somebody to hold your hand as you do it. So it's a great place to start. Now, the type of, of home brewing that I'm going to be talking about is another step on from this. So you really will be starting from scratch. You'll be sourcing your own components, uh, designing, producing your own boards. Um, and uh, there isn't anybody holding your hand, <laughs> which kind of sounds a bit scary at first, but actually is enormously empowering as well, because once you get confident at this, it's your build. You can do whatever you want, <laughs> right? You know, um, uh, and actually, although... Um, you're not following uh, a, a kind of blow by blow detail of, of how to do it. Um, the homebrew community in Amateur Radio uh, are some of the kindest and friendliest people that I've ever met, actually, all over the world. And I correspond with people all over the world from across the pond to New Zealand and Australia and, and, and everywhere in between um, a community of like minded people that are doing this stuff. Um, and there are lots and lots of people that are far more brainy than me and far more experienced than me and, um, and are very kind and willing to, to help if you get stuck on something. There's also loads of forums, I'm sure, as you're aware, that you can post things and stuff. Um, and, and ask for help and because we all need help at some stage, no, no matter how long we've been doing this. Now, I, I, I just post that picture there just, just because that was the last major build that I did. I finished it Christmas Eve, actually. And that is what I call the really useful rig, so-called because it's built, as you can see, in a, a very RF unfriendly, really useful box. Um, it's actually a phasing tri-band SDR transceiver. It uses a teensy microcontroller. You'll see that on the front. It's got a nice flash TFD display with waterfall, spectral display, S meter, eight different uh, swappable software filters, all the bells and whistles, right? Um, and and very often when I do these kind of talks, I'm I'm talking about stuff like this because this is the stuff I build. I build HF transceivers basically, and this was the most complex build that I've done so far. But the trouble with doing a talk about something like this is everybody looks at it and says, "Oh, that's really impressive. That's really cool. Oh, that must have taken you ages or whatever." But then very often what people will say is, "Ah, but I could never do that." That's way above me, you know. That's that's you know. Um, uh, and the, the problem is, it, it can sometimes be a, a disincentive to people, you know. Um, and what I really want to say is, is that you know, um, the, there was a time not all that long ago when I could never have built that, <laughs> and certainly wouldn't have got it to work, right? Um, but but the truth is, I didn't just wake up one day and decide to start building HF transceivers, right? And the stuff I want to talk to you about tonight is. It are the basic fundamental steps. And if I hadn't have taken those steps and mastered those things, I wouldn't have been able to build that thing in front of you there. Um, so it's foundational stuff. And the great stuff about foundations is once you get those things down, you can build pretty much anything you want, right? And that's that's what I want to try and uh, communicate uh, tonight. So you're not going to see any more uh, transceivers because <laughs> we're going back to basics. So to, to, to build big, you need to think small. And what I mean by that is it, it's possible to think really of all analog radio receivers as just basically different combinations of the same basic building blocks, modules we call them. So by designing a building in this modular fashion, this breaking it down into smaller sections, 
then you, you can take a large and complex project like that transceiver and you can break it up into smaller bite-sized chunks. Now, there's several advantages to doing this, and I've, I've got three here. The first, and this is important because this is a hobby after all, you know, we do this stuff for fun, right? So it, you get a regular sense of satisfaction. You know that sense of satisfaction when you've done something, you've built something yourself, and you think, oh, yeah, it's, it, it's good. The trouble with building one huge project is it might take you months, years to complete this thing. Uh, and, and then the chances of it working at the end are pretty slim, right? You know, whereas actually, if you can break it down into small small bits that you could perhaps build in an evening or over a weekend or a week or whatever, um, you can actually build it and test it and, and, and feel proud that you've, you've done something. You may not have built the whole project, but you've built a bit of it. And that's a really important thing. Secondly, as I've, as I've hinted at, it's far easier to test and fault trace if you've got a small module. Once it's combined in, in a massive thing, you've got a heck of a problem to find out if it doesn't work the way you expected where the problem is. Whereas if you've got a small thing you can isolate, you spend some time with it. If it doesn't work, get it working. Find out why it's not working or working as you want it to. Get it working the way you want, then put it aside and then go and build the next bit, right? Then put that bit, the new bit with the old bit, see if that bit works, you know, and move on from there. And thirdly, you've got a much greater flexibility of design if you build this way. Because let's say you build, I don't know, a bandpass filter. And then, and it's all right, right? But you see another design, a different design for a bandpass filter. And you know, I wonder if that one would work better than the one I built. Well, build it. Build it and find out, right? And if it does, then you can swap it out. And, and the great thing about breaking things down is you can mix things around, change the order that you've got them in, add extra stages, all of this stuff you can do, which you can't do if you've got one big PCB with all the parts on, right? Not easily. So, um, so that's why um, uh, it's it's good to uh, to, to build uh, small, well, to think small and to build big. So, and um, so we're going to build. Um, with some building blocks. So what are these building blocks? Well, I would suggest that there are essentially only four building blocks to building pretty much any analog radio. Now, these are wide generic terms and people will say, ah, but, but, you know, stick with me here. There's essentially four. They're, here they are. You've got filters. You've got mixers. You've got oscillators. And you've got amplifiers. And you can pretty much build any analog radio with a combination of, of these. Now, I know, you know, there's, a, there's many different types of amplifiers, right? And, and tonight we're only going to look at, at one, and that's an audio amplifier. You won't do much building before you, you, you're required to build some kind of uh, RF amplifier, which is different. You know? There are different kinds of oscillators. There are different kinds of mixers, different filters. But essentially, those are the basics. Now, what I want to do is, is to take one project, and this project uses just these four basic building blocks, and that is a direct conversion receiver. Because a direct conversion receiver is this. You have an antenna which goes into a bandpass filter for your frequency. We're going to do 80 meters. Um, so now the bandpass filter sends your RF into a product detector. But look, it's just a mixer. It just happens to be a mixer that mixes down to audio. And a, a mixer, a product detector, is, is a three-port device. There's two inputs and one output. So, so your one input is your, is your RF signal. Uh, the other input comes from your local oscillator. Um, and then they get mixed uh, together, and we're going to, uh, there's a multiplication pro process, and we detect the product, good name, um, uh, and then um, we uh, recover the audio, which goes into an audio amplifier, and then we squirt that out, technical term, to the loud speaker. So that that's about as simple as you can get. I know I could have rocked up here and, and talked about building a crystal set, but I'm, I, I'm talking about, you know, demodulating single sideband here, something you can actually listen to stuff on the amateur bands. So, um, so that's about as, as simple uh, uh, as it gets. Now, how does it work? Now, this hand on heart is the only slide with theory.
<laughs> okay, this is the only slide with something. So if you're not into RF theory and stuff, then just zone out for a couple of minutes. All right, okay. Um, uh, but but if you are, I, this stuff fascinates me. In fact, to be honest, folks, this is the reason I build radios. I build radios so I can understand how the things work. And it's one thing to build it, but once you understand why it does that, you know, and, and that's an incredibly empowering thing because when you've got that knowledge, right, you can use that knowledge to build something else. So, and, and the reason I, I do this is because I never got this. I never understood this. Now, I, I knew, and one of the first things I built was a direct conversion receiver. And you quickly learn when you're tuning across the bands that there's something a bit strange going on here because you're tuning into a signal, but you're hearing a load of other stuff cutting across it as well. And, and when you ask about this, you're usually given the rather glib response. Ah, oh, well, that's because um, a direct conversion receiver receives on both side bands. Now, I didn't understand that, you know, and I thought, what, what do you mean it receives on both side bands? Right? I'm on 80 meters. Who's on upper side band on 80 meters? <laughs> you know, you know how, how's this? I, how can it be? You know, and, so I, and I just didn't get it. I didn't get what people were saying to me. I just didn't. I couldn't visualize how it worked. So very briefly. Um, uh, for those that are interested, this is how it works. Um, so essentially, um, you've got your product detector there, your mixer. Let's say we've got a signal, a, a lower sideband signal on 80 meters, which is sitting three kilohertz wide. So it's sitting at 3697 to 3700. OK, and um, we're going to run our local oscillator at 3700. So what happens uh, uh, in your mixer, we're going to be using a double balance mixer. So what that will do is that will suppress both your inputs. So it will suppress your local oscillator. It will suppress, not as well, <laughs> your, your RF, but the RF is a weaker signal anyway, so it doesn't matter so much. And you'll get then the sum and the different frequencies of what you've put into it. So you'll get um, uh, the sum, uh, and as you'll see, um, if you sum those together, we end up with our RF signal just lying just north of the, the top end of the, uh, the 40 meter band, right? Now, we don't need to worry about that because we're recovering audio. And in our mixer, when you see it, we've got a little RF choke there, which will choke out any RF. So we, we, we can ignore that, basically. What we're interested in is the difference. So the difference is the RF minus the LO. Incidentally, you, you can do... LO minus RF, it, it, it doesn't make any difference to the mixer because it doesn't know what it's supposed to be subtracting from, from, from what else. Um, but I would encourage you to, when you're doing this calculation, start with the RF uh, and you'll see why. So if we take the RF uh, and we subtract the LO from it, uh, we end up uh, with naught DC. Well, you would expect that. But hang on a minute, 3697 minus 3700 is minus three kilohertz. You think, how the heck can you have minus three kilohertz? Well, of course you can't. Um, well, you can mathematically, but in, in reality, there's no such thing as minus three kilohertz. There's just three kilohertz. Um, so what happens is this. Okay, so let's imagine this is our signal, this this uh, this green triangle. So, um, And you've probably seen these diagrams before. Now, the, the height of that triangle corresponds to um, the amplitude of the uh, uh, of the the frequencies. Um, uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. It's it's the frequency um, that your the, of the modulated audio. So in other words, um, uh, the the lower sideband is inverted. So if you look at it, you've got the lowest frequencies at a higher frequency than the low than the low bit. If you see what I mean. Now, if we were on upper sideband, it'd be the opposite way around. But so we start off with lower sideband with an inverted signal anyway. That's what I'm trying to say. So let's say we're going to demodulate that then. So what happens is um, uh, we take it down mathematically to that, right? But that can't exist in, in reality because you can't have a minus three. So you're ready for this. Watch this. Three, two, one. It goes uh, 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 ooh, like that. And it, it folds around the DC point to lie at naught to three, it's inverted. And that's what that minus tells us on the minus three. It tells us that the signal is inverted in, in the process, really important. Now, happy days, because our lower sideband signal that was inverted to start off with is now the right way, it's now down to audio and the right way. So we listen to it, it's gonna be fine. Well, brilliant. Oh, oh. oh it's because something popped up. So what's the problem then? Well, the problem is folks, unfortunately, 
3697 to 3700 is not the only frequency that will mix down to naught to three. Um, because if we had an upper sideband signal there, that would mix down, an upper sideband doesn't get inverted, that will mix down to the same thing. But you will say, we're not going to get any upper sideband on 80 meters, are we? No, we're not. But what we might well have, especially on a busy weekend, especially if there's a contest on or something, is we could very well have another lower sideband signal three, um, uh, three kilohertz above it. And that will, that because that's occupying the upper sideband slot, if you like, that's what people mean when they say it receives on both sidebands, that gets mixed down as well. But because it's in the upper sideband slot, it doesn't get inverted. So what you actually end up listening when you tune your direct conversion receiver is you get your dark green triangle, which is the audio signal, the, the signal you've demodulated, the one you want. But over the top of that is, is a, anything that happens to be three kilohertz up above you, which will probably be another lower sideband signal. So it'll sound like you've got upper sideband over your lower sideband signal. So there's nothing you can do about that, folks. That is a direct conversion receiver, blame physics, okay? The only thing you can do about it is you can change your direct conversion receiver into something else like um, a single conversion superhead. In actual fact, I, I smiled when you were talking about Tristan uh, <laughs> earlier, because um, he's already booked me to do this talk um, at, at his radio club. Um, and he's already booked me to do the sequel, <laughs> which is to turn this, what we're going to do tonight, into a single conversion super, which I've actually done in reality. I haven't done the talk yet, but I've done that in reality. And that, that cures this problem. Anyway, enough theory, right? Let's get on with it. So um, homebrewing wisdom says you start at the back and you work forwards, okay? So that would mean starting with the audio amp, then the product detector, then the local oscillator, and then the bandpass filter. So um, here we go. So the audio amp. Now, I thought about producing some nice computer generated graphics and thought, no, this is pretty much what I do, right? I would, I would draw it on, on, on paper and pencil, use pencil. <laughs> Because if you go wrong or you make a mistake or you change your mind, you change the value of that capacitor or something, you know, you can rub it out and, and do it. Really, really good idea to, to do that first. Um, and we're going to use a little LM386 chip. Full disclosure, I've never used one in any of my rigs. I would usually have a dedicated audio preamp and then a much more beefier um, uh, audio stage like a, a TDA 2003, something 10 watt audio stage or something like that. But I'm trying to keep this as simple and as doable as possible. So I'm I'm using this, and I've got to tell you folks, I'm seriously impressed with with the effect of this little chip. It, it performed a lot better, and you'll hear exactly in a minute how it performs um, uh, than I thought it was. Um, but it's a very simple little circuit. Um, the the gain is fixed. Um, it's fixed by this section um, uh, uh, on the kind of the top right hand corner of the chip, actually. Um, but so what we do is we, we, we've got a, a logarithmic uh, potentiometer, which just varies how much signal we're putting into it, essentially. Um, and that will drive an eight ohm or a, a four ohm speaker. Um, so uh, let me show you it. OK, so um, I've got a close up in a minute. So that, that's the basic the little, little thing. Actually, <laughs> this is more through look than judgment. But all four modules that I've built, I've used different construction techniques, which is actually quite fortuitous for, for, for tonight's purposes. But so this is using um, strip board, which for audio stuff is absolutely fine. I wouldn't go anywhere near it for RF stuff because all those little copper traces act like stack capacitors. And if you've got a tune circuit there, um, it doesn't play nicely at all. Um, that's just an old speaker from an, an old 5.1 surround sound system that I had lying around. Um, and um, so that's connected in there. So can we close? So that's a little thing. Um, now you'll see uh, if you remember on the schematic, there was a. a it takes nine volts. So I run this at nine volts, but I run everything at twelve volts, like a lot of us do. So I've got a little regulator um, chip on on there just to take it down to nine, and um, that's pretty much it. Um, on the underneath, um, you can see what you do, and I'm. I'm if you never used this material before, basically you have like a kind of braddle thing, basically to um, just break the traces, and it's pretty easy. It's it's quite a good compact way. If you've got ICs and things like this, it's great. You stick the legs through; it it sits nicely together. 
you've got to be careful. Uh, you've got to remember if you need to link some of those traces, remember to put those links in. <laughs> um, you've got to remember to break the traces. Um, I've shorted many things out through not breaking. If you've got different bits that are just hanging on one particular trace, then you, you've, you've got to remember to short them out. Um, and also, if you're piling up a whole load of solder, like some of these, this is really, um, sometimes you can bridge your solder connections and end up shorting one thing to another as well. So you need to be a bit careful of that. But basically, for audio stuff, it's, it's pretty simple and, and you can make it pretty small. Um, all right, we're going to listen to it now. So you might need to turn your volume up a bit. And uh, this is uh, this is trialing the audio amplifier. OK, well, here is the audio section. And um, I'm just going to press the play. Now I've got my iPhone here with a bit of um, Johann Sebastian on there. Uh, turn to about, you can probably just see, about a third of the volume uh, on the phone. So I'm just going to... Um, uh, press the play and tweak the volume on the uh, on the audio app. So, as you can hear, um, there's a fair bit of gain there and really good um, sound uh, reproduction there. No hissing, buzzing, clicking, lots of the stuff that you often get um, with, those, um, with those chips sometimes. If you can, uh, if you can build it uh, carefully, then um, yeah, get some good results. So uh, that uh, is the, the audio stage. Right, okay, so that's, that's the audio amp, and um, um, that's what you can do. Uh, there are easy things to test. You just put an audio source in, like your phone, test it, get it working okay, put it down, let's move on to the next stage. So the next stage is the is the product detector, and we're going to use <clears throat> a little SA602, NE602, 612, they're all the same, um, active, double-balanced mixer. Um, and this will need regulating down to six volts. They're quite fussy about that. Um, and you'll see at the bottom left-hand corner the, the AF out. I, I mentioned that before. Um, we're going to put a, a Millie Henry choke in there, a little filter there, just to uh, choke off any RF. So we're going to get RF into the audio. Similarly, there's a, uh, a, a smaller choke, um, 6.8 micro Henry's, which is on the uh, the VCC line as well, just to keep any uh, RF out of the the, 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 the power line. Um, the only other thing, I mean, it's pretty simple, really. I mean, I you'll see in a minute. I this is built a dead bug style, so um, I I glue it upside down on its back <laughs> and splay the legs out, and um, and some of them get soldered to ground. Um, and some of them, uh, uh, you just solder the, uh, the, 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 well, the capacitors, aren't they, um, onto the, the, the legs. And you'll see that in a minute. Um, the only other thing is just to say about matching impedances. Now, for audio, it doesn't matter too much. The, the rule of thumb really is as long as the output of your audio stage is going into a higher input of the next stage, you're pretty much all right. Um, for RF, it does matter greatly. Uh, because maximum power transfer happens when uh, impedances of stages are matched, and if you if they're not, you you well I don't need to tell you about this. We're radio hams. It, it's about SWR. It's, you get signal reflected back, and so signal that you want to go forward just gets reflected back. So um so you want to try and match it as best as you can. Now the the output impedance or input impedance as well of, of an SA six hundred two is one thousand five hundred ohms, um, and of course the RF coming in from our bandpass filter, which we're not built yet. Um, will be 50 ohms, so we need to transform that. And so what I did is I just built a little um, uh, transformer. So it's built on a little FT 3743 toroid, um, which is 11 turns, 
to two turns, uh, uh, number 28 enameled copper wire. Um, and that does the job quite nicely. Uh, and you should be able to see it, I think. Um, Okay, well, that's, I put it. I, I put this in a tin. I put I, there's a number of things are in a tin just because I do this talk a bit, and and it's for my own uh, prototyping. It's handy to be able to just reach in the drawer and pull out a product detector or a mixer or something, you know, or a, an amplifier or whatever. Um, and so I, I tend to do that. You wouldn't necessarily have to do that if you were building it as one unit that you weren't going to break up. But um, um, it, it's all right. I got a load of these cheap off eBay. Uh, so there it is. So you see what I mean? Now, this employs, I don't know what you call this. It's kind of a variation on the Manhattan style, um, but but I kind of call it the engraving style, really. I, I invested in a kind of cheapy Dremel thing, you know, one of these engraving things um, that uh, is superb, really. I just saw someone on uh, one of the construction sites on Facebook had used this thing. I thought, what a good idea. Uh, because before this, what I tended to do is glue little... Um, tiny pads on uh, and and put them on there. I'm far too OCD to do complete ugly style <laughs> where you just have them all hanging in midair, you know. So and I like it more securely anchored down. So it's just single sided copper board uh, which you you uh, treat with some you know fine wire wool and just get all that enamel off it so you, uh, you've got a good uh, conductive plane and that's your ground plane. And then you, uh, I use one of those little pens that we used to write on CD ROMs when people had CD ROMs, <laughs> and and just kind of mark it on on they use a sharpie or something and then and dremel it out the little uh, pads and then go over with a multimeter and, and check that they're electrically isolated from each other um, and then you can just tin your pads and do that now that has, this has the advantage that everything's on the same level so the pitch of your components when you put them down you can actually you don't have to make what the legs are one higher or anything you know you can just put them all down flat and they, they lie quite flat which is quite good um, so um, yeah, so that's what it looks like, um, and you can see I've got some different connectors uh, in. That's the power connector, obviously, at the top. Uh, I've got an audio jack on the bottom left, um, obviously for the audio going out. I've got um, uh, a BNC over there, and another RF connector which matches um, what we're going to use um, for the local oscillator one. Right. Talking of which, let's move on to the local oscillator now. Don't be scared by this next picture. <laughs> I could, I could, I could have just said, um, you know, build an analog VFO, um, and yes, that would have been simple. To it depends how you mean simple, but to get it working and get it stable is anything but simple. I've built many, many of these things, um, and uh, with varying degrees of failure, really. I think in terms of frequency stability. Um, so um, I'm going to show you what I did when I built my first one which was to, to, to plunge right in at the deep end um, and to go the route of using an Arduino um, and an SI5351 um, phase lock loop generator module. Um, now, it looks confusing. Um, it, it's not, actually, um, because uh, the, the thing about, there's a number of things about this setup. Um, we're just using this. We're just using the Arduino simply to power the local oscillator. This is not like I was doing in my transceiver where you know a lot of the, the the work of the radio is being done you know in the microprocessor that's not happening here it's all it's doing is it's controlling the, the frequency um which the si5351 is putting out and we're controlling it with a little rotary encoder and we're displaying it nice and simple on a 16 by 2 um uh lcd display uh, most things these days and for all of these things here are use what they call the the i squared c bus which is enormously helpful. If you look at that, that little picture of the LCD display, what we used to have to do when I first started out, you'd have to take a pin from a connection from every one of those pins and put them into your microcontroller. You can imagine you ain't going to have many pins left for anything else, right? Uh, until um, you get these great little converters that go on the back of them that converts it to the I square C bus. And all that's only four connections. You've got your power in which could be five volts or three volts. You've got your ground, you've got your data, which is the orange one, and you've got the clock, which is the, the yellow one. And although I've got them going into different pins here on the Arduino, the truth is, because it's a bus, all those yellow leads could go into the same thing. All those orange leads could go into the same thing. The Arduino 
deals with the addressing of these different modules. You don't need to worry about that, right? That's the, the great thing about this. Um, I have the code that I use. It's not my code. It's code I've taken and adapted like everybody else does. Um, but you're welcome to it um, if you want the code to do this uh, project. And it's, it's, it's good code because it's the kind of thing that you can adapt very easily um, it's it's set up um, for direct conversion mode, but just by commenting a few little bits out, tweaking a few bits, you can actually get it um, to produce uh, a local oscillator and a, and a BFO um, uh, if you if you want a super het. If you want to do some kind of phasing rig, you can get it to output four times the frequency. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. What I would say about this stuff, there is a bit of a learning curve. And if you've not messed around with Arduinos before, I would I, I would suggest do it. Get it. Don't worry about radio from it. But have a play around with it. Get the little flashing LED going. Do Get the things linked up, working, you know, incrementing the from 1 to 10 and back again. Do all that stuff. Because if you can, this is a building block that will really, really help you moving forward if you're going to build stuff. Um, because there's... Actually, although we're only using a fraction of its capability, you know, as you get used to this stuff, you can actually offload some things to to the uh, to the Arduino or, or another microcontroller if you're using it. Um, so you can have switching happening and, and all kinds of different things can go on. But we're not worried about this uh, at this stage. This is just nice and simple. It's just producing um, uh, a, a, a VFO. And uh, this is it. Um, it doesn't look like that now because actually I thought this was so useful. I've actually built this into a little metal tin um, that I can put in the drawer and pull out when I need it. Uh, so it's just breadboarded and you see just a few wires um, but, um, and that's it. Upload the code via USB, via that um, uh, USB port there and uh, jobs are good. Right, the final stage, the low pass filter. Now, this is a screen grab from uh, the, the Windows software LC, E-L-S-I-E, -E, which is a pun on L-C, of course, as in kind of inductance capacitance. And it's a, it's a, a program um, for uh, modeling and testing um, tuned circuits, filters mainly. Uh, so if you're used to this kind of stuff, you know, you can ignore the, the, the end stops, the bookends here. So those 50 ohm resistors are not really 50 ohm resistors. They're just simulating the input impedance and the output load. What you've got essentially is um, section one and section three you'll see are identical. And then you've got a different section in the middle. So this is a what we call three pole Butterworth uh, bandpass filter. Um, so uh, you've just got a, an inductor and a capacitor. Uh, in parallel on both ends, and then a series one uh, in the middle. Um, and uh, this is what it looks like, <laughs> my version. Now, that looks a bit worse because I, I've put down the individual, because I didn't just use one capacitor. I used, I stacked them in parallel, you know, to make those up. And I also wanted to make some of that capacitance variable because that's going to help enormously because those two end capacitances, right, with their little trimmers, will adjust where your frequency of your filter is right so you can if it's a if it's peaking too early you can push it on a bit or you know and the middle one the middle trimmer is is um is is how those two kind of um couple together right uh, and this is where you can see you know kind of over coupled thing where the capacitance is too great and you get like a great to twin peak mounting, you know, in the filter, or, or if it's if it's if it's not coupled enough and it's just like one peak and it's really sharp or whatever, and you can tweak that and get the kind of shape um, that that you want. Um, so um, I seem to use thundering big cores. I'm not sure what. <laughs> I'm not sure how many watts I thought I was going to be putting through this this at the time, but anyway, there we are. So, um, uh, uh, but if you don't like to use those scores, uh, go to toroids.info uh, on the net, and the, you can punch in your values and, and get how many turns you need uh, um, for your required inductance and, and everything. Um, and um, again, I put it in a box. Now, actually, putting these in a tin is a good idea, even if you're building this into a bigger thing. Uh, I think shielding for filters, I think, is is a really useful thing. Um, and so that's it. Uh, and so you can see my little trimmers there. And um, yeah, and that's a bit of wax just holding it in there. I don't always do that, to be honest, but um, but I did on this occasion. Um, and uh, the LC model predicted this. So this is what it, it on, on, you know, doing the simulation, it's supposed to look like. 
so just kind of get that picture in your mind because I'm going to show you what it actually looks like now. And what it actually looks like is this. I was pretty pleased with that. Um, so that's what it, that was the predicted one. And that is a screen grab from my Nano VNA, which I noticed wasn't calibrated properly at that frequency, but never mind. Um, but with an insertion loss of less than, a, uh, than one dB. So I, for a homebrew filter, I was um, well pleased with that. And nice and flat and Butterworth filters tend to be um, uh, nice and flat, although not as sharp, you'll notice in the skirts. You, you could use a, a, like a Chevy Chev design, which would give you far sharper skirts, but you get more ripple in the pass band then. So you, it's, you know, it's kind of horses for courses, really. Um, so when you connect these four modules together and add to it an antenna for 80 meters, what do you get? Da, 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 da. You get this. So um, this is uh, the assembled rig. Um, and uh, yeah, so not that big really. Um, uh, as I say, some of it's boxed up, even more of it's boxed up now. And uh, finally, does it actually work? <laughs> <laughs> well, judge for yourself. Um, so I'm just going to play a little bit of video that I recorded uh, just tuning across the 80 meter band uh, uh, a little while ago. Okay, Bill, Golf 6, uh, Golf Yankee Whiskey, this is South Carolina number 7, Fox Golf Lima. Uh, WX here in Belgium, yes, we had uh, in the weekend, uh, we had uh, we had some little snow uh, during the evening, but uh, all the snow has uh, melted um, this morning. Also, a little bit uh, snow, but uh, that was nothing at all. And uh, yes, it, it's cold outside, it's cold outside, the temperature is okay. Uh, but the minutes are around And so um, thank you very much, folks, uh, for listening. Uh, as I said, there is uh, a PDF version of this presentation, uh, which includes all the schematics and everything, all the photos, uh, if, if, and if you, which I can let you have. Uh, and if you want the code, the Arduino code, then I can let you have that as well. And if you're interested in any more of my homebrew adventures, then please uh, have a look on YouTube for M0NTV.
home brewing. Thank you very much. And if there's anybody got any questions, um, I'd be happy to um, try and answer them. Okay, br br this. brilliant, Nick. Very good indeed. Uh, we've got one question already. Someone's just put into the chat. Kim, N8FNC. How would you implement a VFO for CW? Mate, that's a BFO. Sorry. <laughs> um, how uh, a BFO? Um, you uh, well, essentially, that's that's making the the, the superhet uh, conversion, um, which is quite easy to do um with uh with the arduino uh because the set, we we're just using clock zero uh, when you convert it to a superhet you usually the, the 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 idea is i don't know why nobody why everybody's got it in for clock one but nobody ever uses clock one but use clock zero and clock two um so you can configure that uh clock two um and that that will give you uh that would give you another um uh, rf uh tone uh what you'd also have to add for for the super het of course um uh is is another mixer a first mixer which so you'd you'd keep that 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 mix you've got there you'd have a first mixer you'd have a crystal filter probably and i've actually home started home brewing my own crystal filters now which was all sort was a bit of a dark art actually but it's not as bad as 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 you think uh, but you can just buy them <laughs> and um if you can find them uh and maybe a little bit of if amplification so that gets you into the realms of building a, an, an rf um, amplifier or two um but and then add that to what you've already got essentially and um uh and with a bit of tweaking of the code you've then got um uh, a super head. yeah nick just going before anyone else comes in going back on his question there so your your VFO and direct conversion receiver would work on CW as it does on LSB on 80 meters. Oh yeah, it would work the, now. The, the difference being that you would you could tune on either side of the transmission. Yes. So you could come from either below or top, but it would sound identical when you've when you've tuned it in. Yeah, no, thank you. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yes, it, as is it, it would work, but yeah. Okay, anyone else got a question? Kim, were you happy yeah. with that or got a follow-up question? I've got a question. Yes, go on, Gerald. Yeah, okay, just a quick one, if I may. And yes, I agree with that. I built a direct conversion, and it does work quite well on CW as well. But uh, the other thing is about the Arduino, right? I've already bought it. It's here. I haven't used it yet. Uh, what's the frequency range can you get a stable signal on? How far up could I make it go if I didn't want it for 80 metres? The, well... The it's the SI fifty three fifty one of course which produces the signal, not the Arduino. All the Arduino is doing is the Arduino will only do like audio tones. So, but the SI fifty three fifty one will do well. It 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 reckons something like didn't it say on that thing something like eight kilohertz to one hundred and sixty megahertz? But it's it's low kilohertz up to you should be able to get it up. To, theoretically, you should be able to get up to the two meter band essentially i i have to say i've never tried that high what you will notice is that and i noticed it even on uh on actually building that uh that transceiver uh on 20 meters i don't get as much output it's not the, it's not as linear i don't think now maybe i've just got some cheap chinese knockoffs <laughs> and, and the originals are better but but um you you tend to find that uh Sometimes, yeah, that's it. That's the thing. Um, now you can actually buy them. Usually, when they that the, the, the kind of with the actual uh, connectors as well. Although you often have to solder those on. You have to turn your soldering iron up pretty high uh, and to solder those little uh, uh, connections on. Or you can just um, hardwire them. But um, yeah, that was eight eight to one hundred and sixty. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's um, what they what they say. Um, I've I've only ever used it over the HF range, but it's it's a pretty impressive bit of kit, you know, for for not very much money. Uh, I mean, I bought three of them last night on AliExpress for a tenner, so you know uh, you can't really go wrong with that. Thanks. Are you still there, Gerald? Is that okay? Gerald's frozen, I think. <laughs> yeah, Gerald. We've lost Gerald. Right. Anyone else got a, a, a question for, for Nick? Uh, from Terry G3 VFC. Yeah, go ahead, Terry. Um, Nick, a, a lovely, lively presentation. And thank you. And 
I can just imagine the delight of hearing that thing burst into life when you first powered it up. Absolutely brilliant. Thanks for sharing it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Anyone else with a question? Uh, wave at me or just break in uh, if you're not talking on top of someone else. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, go on, Roger. Yeah. Uh, Nick, I wonder, those little things, how stable are they? Are they much more stable than anything else you can get near? You mean the SI-5351? Yeah, the oscillator. Very stable. Well, they're, they're, they're phase lock loops. So, so they're working on a 25 megahertz crystal um, with, a, with, with this, this locking system that stops it, which actually, funny enough, for my intermediate project when, when I was, when I was uh, becoming a radio amateur, I, I, oh dear, I was, I, I became obsessed with analog VFOs <laughs> and trying to get the blooming things to, to, you know, <laughs> you know, but the first one I built, you could put it on the bottom of the 80 meter band, go and make a cup of tea. <laughs> You're at the top by the time we go. It was ridiculous. And, and Hans Summers of, of, of QRP Labs fame, um, on his website, has got a whole wealth of other stuff that he, he was, he's, he's dabbled with all kinds of things. And one of the things he, he messed around with for many years, was that huff and puff stabilizers it was this this idea that you kind of um, you're kind of making lots of little corrections to, to the frequency to stop it drifting off and I actually built one of these but it's enormously complex really but the great thing about these these things are yes they are they're very very stable you can you calibrate them. when you get one there's um the guy it's called Jason Mildrum who who has written a lot of this alternative code for them um and you, all these stuff's on github and and and, and whatever and, and in fact the stuff i my code is based on jason mildrum's um but also he has a library that you download an arduino and a kind of alternative si5351 library with a with a, um, a calibration thing and essentially what it does is you inject like a 10 megahertz signal into it and you just keep you, and you use your keyboard and the terminal display to kind of put it up and down so you can get it crack on um so yeah they are enormously stable yeah that's amazing and um, for the cost i just looked them up two quid i know i know they are very very, very good Thank at all you. i mean you can't I, and it's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm not sure i could be bothered to be, <laughs> to build an analog vr phone now having 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 done that really, just because the just you, it's something you don't have to worry about. There's lots of other things you have to worry about building the radio, but at least the frequency stability, you don't have to worry too much about, which is, is good. Okay, thank you, Roger. Right, anyone else with a question for Nick? Everyone's gone very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one uh, question. Yes, go on, John. Yeah, thank you for a splendid talk. Uh, very well presented. Um, talking about analog VFOs, I've always thought the hardest part of building any sort of receiving or variable frequency kit is the actual mechanics of tuning it. Mm. Um, you look at things like the sudden. Uh, DQRP thing vaunted as suitable for beginners. It's not. You need neurosurgeon's fingers <laughs> amplified 10 times to tune it in. You know, anything that covers a whole band on one turn of a knob is difficult. I'd just yeah. be polite there. And um, right. stability of um, BFOs. If you start with a varicap in it, you're on a hiding to nothing. If you actually look at the drift factors that are involved. Um, it was all written up many, many years ago by, I think, G3 PDM. And it's fairly straightforward. Lots of C, lots of stability. Get the temperature coefficients right. Mm. But, um, that's, it gets a bit of engineering. So I think the digital um, tuners uh, look promising for that. The other point being, of course, that the cost of making a kit, you can go out and buy something very often. Uh, which is uh, life's too short, you know. It's great making things, but you've got to question if you're making it for the enjoyment of making it, that's one thing, but if you're making it 
when I grew up when there was a lot less stuff around and perhaps you had to. Now it's mm. a different world. But I sometimes think that people's outlooks hasn't really changed. I mean, the last amateur radio rally I went to, disgusting heaps of old filthy junk people wanted to sell. It was pay to take it away type stuff, you know. I don't know. Maybe times have moved on and I haven't, or the other way around. But thank you very much for a splendid talk anyway. No, no, you're welcome. No, thank you. And No, you're right. And I think you... you the, the, yes. I mean, I think things, the cost, the relative cost of things has has come down enormously. And I think, I mean, I, I build things just because I, I enjoy building them, really, you know, uh, to be honest. And, and really needlessly reinvent the wheel um, just because I'm curious. So, you know, um, uh, I, I could use, um, well, it, I, I have used like um, uh, a commercial um, passive uh, diode uh, mixers. But, but recently I've been building my own and matching the diodes and stuff. And you think, well, why, why do you bother with all that stuff? Well, just because I can, <laughs> you know, just because I want, I want to work out how it, how, it, how it works. I have a flash, a flash Yesu transceiver, you know. Um, so I, it's not like I'm, I'm, I need to, 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 <laughs> to build any of this stuff. Um, but I, I just do it because I get far more enjoyment out of, you know, um, using my own stuff than I do using the commercial stuff, really. Um, but yeah, it, it is. I mean, there are some instances where uh, it, it can be cheaper to to buy. I mean, I think. I mean, I suppose the, the example we all know here is, is antennas. I suppose I, I'm amazed at what people will pay for a bit of wire. <laughs> You know, just because it's got a fancy label on it or something, or some ridiculous guarantee of the gain on it or something. But so, but yes, uh, essentially, I do it for fun, really. But yeah. <laughs> and Nick. Yeah, that's that's fine. I think antennas are okay till the snake oil runs out. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, would you uh, mind saying a few words about your loop on the ground? I've had one in my backyard for a while now and I've been quite delighted with its performance and apparently you found it works too. Rachel M1AYG just pointed me to your YouTube video on that a few days ago and I was delighted that more people were were working with those. Yes it's, it's funny because I've only just started that YouTube um, channel and I did have a kind of catch-all that had a whole load of completely unrelated amateur radio, non-amateur radio things uh, connected with other stuff that I do. Um, so um, and so not, not many videos had many views on, on that but that one has had more views than blooming anything really which is really interesting and I've had a few comments about that loop on the ground. The, I came to it because um, I have such terrible uh, QRM here on 80 meters. It really seems to be 80 meters, uh, which is a pain because I enjoy 80 meters. Um, uh, and so I've tried different uh, things. Um, and I thought, well, I, I, I managed to, to, to see this uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the web uh, and looked at it. And I saw a couple of other YouTube videos of a guy that had adapted it. And, and he had kind of mixed success with it. It was a UK ham. And I thought, well, I'd give it a go because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just, a, you know, a, a, I've got a reasonable enough garden here. I'll just peg it out on the lawn and see how I get on, really. But I was amazed at how well it works. Uh, I mean, it does it does attenuate your signal as well a little bit. I mean, I, I think you have to say that. But what you can do um, is even if I'm using the loop on the ground with... with um, both preamps on on the on the on the Yesu 991. Um, it, the noise is far less than if I just use my NFED half wave with with you know with no preamp. So I mean it's it just makes it much more pleasant to listen to. Um, but yeah, it's I, I think the great thing about it is is that you don't need any great space really as long as you've got enough space to spread a <laughs> you know square of of, of wire out somewhere um it's worth it i, I think it only works for lower bands it pro probably it works i think quite well for um, top band and and it will i think it'll probably work up to about 80 meters or uh, up to 40 meters or maybe even higher but uh but yeah but I, i've been quite pleased with it really i did think about some kind of 
switching thing, whereas I could, you know, transmit on the the NFED half wave and, and receive on that. But I, I, I've not kind of got too far with that. But if you're just having a listen to what's going on, it's yeah, it's great, really good. No, I, 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 that's all I have. I live in the, in the intended restricted area, and I strictly have to use uh, the loop. And the only problem that I have, of course, is if I change bands, it takes a bit for me to tune it. Yeah. Uh, and another problem I have, if I forget to bring it in when I'm not using it, and water gets inside on the variable capacitor, then forget it. So what I do, I put it outside and while well, I'm using it, and then I bring it in when I'm not using it. Right. Uh, but that's all I have because I'm in the antenna restricted area. Sure. And if you took a look at my, my paper logs just from the last few days, I mean, I, 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 I work primarily into Europe, but I mean, I, I'm getting the contacts. Yeah. So it, it, it does work. Yeah, it's great. I mean, yours sounds more advanced than mine because mine doesn't have any uh, separate tuning. It, it's just a fixed, um, you know, a, a, a fixed frequency, which um, I'm surprised it works as well as it does, really, to be honest. But um, yeah. yeah like, I like, think like his I say, is a. Is Go ahead. I, I think his is a tuned loop, uh, which is not lying on the ground, because lying on the ground, it's working as an untuned loop antenna. Yeah, mine's not my, well, I don't think it's tuned. I did put the antenna analyzer on it, actually, and it's, um, it's I mean, yes, to be honest, not as high as I would have thought <laughs> a bit of wire lying on the ground would have been, actually, but um, interesting. But yeah, I think that's the idea. And just because it's receiving, I guess, you know, that's not such a big deal. Yeah, I, I do transmit on mine up to 100 watts. Right. Oh, so yours is transmitting. one. That's yes. interesting, actually, because so I heard about, um, yes, I heard about that, because um, I didn't believe that would be even be possible, really, to kind of transmit on one that's on the ground but that's very interesting so yeah that would need to be tuned but that's yeah. amazing that you do so well transmitting uh, on the ground wow right, and, and and up to 100 watts now I, I i of course the bands are just starting to pick up and i haven't really tried it i don't think that i will do well on 15 meters but from 20 through 80 i i do fine wow i'm gonna have to investigate that. that's really yeah. <laughs> thank you that's very interesting like, like i say when you QSY, it takes a bit to retune it. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Even within the band, it, it, it takes a bit to retune it. But but you, you can, and I use an analyzer so I can tell where I am and then uh, put it back on the radio. Fascinating. Nick, be careful. Don't don't transmit into your loop on the ground or you're going to fry that little <laughs> transformer in the box. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not remotely tempted to try and do that. <laughs> I'm I'm in a similar situation on one of the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan, with lots and lots of RF noise, and my primary antenna is a vertical, so it picks up noise from 360 degrees. I've pretty much given up ever working on 160 meters, but the loop on the ground gives me hope. Mm -hmm. Well. So, oh, I see somebody's asked some stuff in the chat here, actually. Um, what am I building next? Um, well, I'm not entirely certain, actually. Um, I thought I might have a go. Uh, um, there's uh, some guy I've been corresponding with who's, who's, who had an article in Radcom about um, uh, a, a DSB noise cancelling thing that he's, he's built around a, around the teensy microcontroller, which is, is what I kind of enjoy playing with. So I've got all the stuff for that. So I, I've, I've been in touch with him. So I might have a little go at that because uh, that's the other thing. I did invest in one of those BHI noise cancelling speakers, you know, um, just to see. And that, I mean, that helps. Um, but, you know, you, you're sitting through a, a waterfall, aren't you, or a dripping tap all the time. <laughs> but but uh but it but it but it helps but uh yeah so one one thing i have to what does the sequel contain well the, yeah the se the sequel i haven't actually done the sequel yet um to this talk but it, but it will contain the steps needed to to take what you've already got to be um uh, uh a super hex basically a single conversion super hex, which is not as big as you as you might um uh, think it's just a few extra stages 
some of which we've already built. We've just got to configure them a bit. Yeah, and the point that Nick made earlier about uh, the VFO, apart from the simplicity and stability um, of those chips, uh, when you're building a VFO, an analog VFO, you, you have got, someone mentioned it earlier, you've got the problem of the uh, of the capacitance, variable capacitance, which is fine, but you've then got to invest in a very good drive that is giving you somewhere like 25 to one movement. Mm. And of course, you know, years ago, we had those things in the, well, I've still got a lot in my junk box, Gerald probably has as well, but they're quite hard to pick up nowadays and they're hellishly expensive. Uh, so for those guys that haven't got them lying around, you know, investing in one of those drives is going to cost you, you know, 10 times the cost of one of those chips. And the, the other thing with that as well, um, Nick, is that you can, I mean, I, I didn't show it on that video. I was just tuning in one kilohertz increments, but you can change it from, well, whatever you want. I mean, I think on the, 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 the sketch, the Arduino code, it goes from one megahertz intervals uh, and I put I put an artificial ceiling of 50 megahertz, 50 megahertz on it. But I mean, as I said, it goes up higher. Um, but you can take you can take it down to one hertz. Now, whether it's going to be quite accurate to that level, I don't know. But I mean, you can certainly take it, you know, and tune. So the tuning can be as smooth, you know, as 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 you want it to be, really. Yeah, I I, I built one uh, Nick with uh, ranging from 100 hertz to a megahertz. So you can move a long way across the band on something like 80 meters, but you can also, you know, tune in very nicely uh, to, to get it to sound right in your ear with 100 hertz on there. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I mean, the, the Arduinos now are so cheap as well. that yeah, It's are. just crazy. It's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. They are. And you could use them. Um, I mean, I used um, an, an Uno just because I had a few lying around. But I mean, you could use a Nano if you want to you know, keep it smaller because it's electrically just the same. It's just smaller, you know. Right. Anyone got a, a, a question to, to Nick? If not, I would like to. Yep. Yeah, just to give. This is, I sound like the auction here. It's an auction here. And we've got a, with a bid. Going, going, um, going. Uh, if not, I'd very much like to thank Nick for his very, very entertaining contribution tonight. Can can we show our appreciation in the normal way, everyone, guys? Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome, Nick. For having me. Thank you very, very much. Good. And and Nick, we we definitely when you've done your 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 sequel talk, we'll we'll come back and. Uh, and, and book you for that one because uh, I mean I think I, I, you you said it to me in your email to me earlier a couple of weeks ago when we were just preparing for the for you coming tonight that uh, talking about building blocks is exactly the right thing to yes. do isn't it um, and I can see what I can see the trick you've pulled there of building them all in the little boxes and you think oh yeah what I need now is a bandpass filter for 40 meters I'll pull that one out and and there it is and and the work's already done so uh, you know you you've made life much simpler for yourself so brilliant it was very very entertaining and if you can send us through Nick uh, the um, the PDF I'll um, put that out in in an email to people and obviously we'll put the a video of this up on on the uh, Denbydale YouTube channel as well tomorrow. I'll send Thank you the you. I'll send you the Arduino sketch as well if anybody wants. Brilliant. Thanks. Fantastic. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Nick.